Hey everyone, welcome to the Worship Artistry Podcast. My name is Jason Houtsma and with me is Christina Kasanka. Oh, Christina, it's good to see you. It is great to see you, Jason. I feel like I haven't been seeing a lot of humans lately. Yeah, you've been stuck in your studio dungeon. <laughs> it's kind of taken me back to the early days of yeah. Worship Artistry. Like when I first started, I mean, it was just song after song after song after song, like hoping it was going to become something at some point. And uh, right now I'm trying to get ahead, mm -hmm. like multiple months ahead on our lessons. So we got some good stuff coming up, everybody. Really good stuff. But uh, I've been doing a lot of shooting, which yeah. I actually think it's kind of interesting. I was thinking about this from the standpoint of actually being like on a worship team, mm -hmm. right? There is something about learning that you get in a rhythm. Because for me, by far the heart, like teaching the song once I know the song is not hard. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm, I'm a natural teacher. There's a system to it. Boom, everything just goes down the, you know, kind of just goes down the, the slide. But when you're learning, that's when it like, it takes a lot. And what I found is that when I'm jumping from a million different things and coming back and trying to learn and then, oh, and then I have a meeting here and then I've got to do this thing. And then I, you know, like it's, it's very difficult to, it, or it just goes slower. Mm -hmm. Whereas like right now my brain is in a learning mentality. And so every day I wake up and I've got my system and I go to town on it. And I thought about it from like a worship team preparation standpoint and going, you know, I try and give my, my worship team, like I don't give them the set lists of every song or, you know, of every Sunday coming mm -hmm. up, but I do give them like, here are going to be the songs that we're going to be pulling from. And so just spending some time getting into those songs. Yeah. And like when you're like, all right, this is what I'm going to do today. And then, because even if you forget it in the time that it, you know, say you end up not mm -hmm. playing that song for two months, you still end up, it comes back so fast. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, I don't know, it's been fun learning yeah. a lot of new songs. And I'm even finding songs that I'm like, I can't wait to introduce these songs. Some good ones. Yeah. I've, that made me think about um, this last Sunday. I had a conversation with a one of my worship leaders who is newer to our church, not new to worship leading, but to our church and the band and, and the team. And I'm still helping her, you know, understand of how we do things. And because um, and, it's different, you know, from yeah. church to church. And I was trying to explain the difference between, um, like, yes, you can give songs to the team in advance and sure. Some musicians will listen to them before some will not like some will know them. Some won't like there is that, but there's something different about actually bringing in a song and doing it with the team and then doing it several times mm -hmm. in order for it to get into the groove of this is how we do this song. Right. And then like, yes, you could bring in a song that's older and it's familiar to the ear, but if you haven't played it as a team, like it's still different. Like it still 100%. feels like a new song that you're doing. Yeah. So even though it's in the, like the recesses of our minds of, Oh, we know this song. It's, I clap like for me as a worship leader, I, cl I still classify those songs as new songs for the band to play. And I was trying to explain that to her uh, just cause we had some uh, conflicts around like certain songs that we were going to do or not just with the band. And we didn't have a rehearsal midweek. It was just a little bit of like, chaos. You guys like arm wrestle or how did you solve that? No, it was uh, an hour before service when we usually have our sound check and we were running through the songs for the first time and where we just had to make some of those decisions of, Hey, like, we're this does not like we can't do it cut this it. morning like cut, we need yeah. to cut it like there's no way we don't have the time to like figure this out yes i understand it's an older song we should know this but we don't so it's just a no like yeah. it's just we just had to have that like conversation then afterwards is kind of when i was trying to explain of like this is my mentality towards this and it's hard to explain i realized of like in my mind how these songs are like in different buckets but kind of made me think about that. Yeah. Well, it's, I find, I feel like one of the best things I do as a worship leader is, and I don't do very many things well. So, you know, <laughs> we love someone those, who's self-aware. <laughs> those, who, those, who, those who can't do teach. Is that what it is? That's something like that. Um, no, I, I actually love being a worship leader. Um, but one of my favorite things is when I've got a new song going, 
I just start introducing that to my team mm -hmm. every every Sunday, like because we 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 have our rehearsals and then we have practice on on Sunday, mm -hmm. and so on Sunday morning when it's like okay we've already got everything dialed, like hey I've been playing around with this new song, mm -hmm. and then we just start doing it, and then like oh we come up with some cool parts, and then it's like okay so then the following week same thing, hey oh yeah we were doing this, and we like slowly build up the song so that, that by the time that we play it. Everyone like knows it, knows mm -hmm. it. It's not like they're sitting there going like, okay, and what's that chord and what's it's like, you cannot replace time. Yeah. Like you, your brain works on things even when mm -hmm. you're not intentionally working on things. And so it's like that idea of like sleeping on it, right? Like, okay, I'll sit there and be like, even sometimes with teaching lessons on worship artistry, I'll like be stuck on a song. And then it's like, I just need to walk away from this. And then the next morning I wake up and I walk right in and nail yeah. it because it's just like, your brain works. And so rather than kind of creating like a, we have to have this deadline and we have to like understanding that you shouldn't have a deadline on a song. Yeah. Like the song is ready when it's ready. Mm -hmm. And if the team's not ready to play it, then they're not don't ready. Don't play that song. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. That's, that's really good. I, I, I love also the progression of even thinking about when we just do a song for the first time and then the way that we're doing it with the band, like a few months later, or maybe, or maybe not even months, but several times later have how the original arrangement, like, yes, we try to copy whatever arrangement, you know, is the original, but then by the fifth time that we, we do it, it's our arrangement by that right, point. Right. Like we've already made it our own. Like we have our, our, like our grooves and our, the way that we lead it, the way that we play it, like, I love it. Like those are my favorite versions of the songs. Like, oh, for sure. Like five times down the road. Like this is this is the way that I like this song. Right. And then I'll listen back to the original. I'm like, nah, we do it better. Like <laughs> <laughs> I actually like the way that we do it. <laughs> totally. No, I I understand completely. Yeah. That's the. I mean, that is so the idea. And I I feel like I feel like that idea gets lost a lot. Like mm -hmm. I always have to explain to people like we call it worship artistry worship artistry because I want you to learn it so you understand it. Mm -hmm. And you're not going, I'm not sure. Yep. I don't know what to do. It's like, no, you know what to do. Now go do something else with it, right? Yep. Like you can operate from a from a space of confidence. But yep. well, uh, you know, speaking of new songs, we have um, a great guest today. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend Gilbert Nanloli, who is a, he's the director of A&R at Integrity Music. And I wanted to have him, I, I got in a great conversation with him when I was out at doing the Anchor Hymns thing. Uh, you know, I was staying in Nashville longer than most of the artists because I was meeting with the teachers. Mm -hmm. And so we got done. I was like, hey, man, you want to you go like grab some lunch or something? And he's like, yeah, let's do it. So he pops out and right away we just we hit it off and we end up just talking about projects that they're working on. Um, they, he has a project that's like real close to his heart called Revere. Mm -hmm. um, but I was just so fascinated by his take on kind of the job of the record label and 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 bringing new voices and bringing new people into into the world. like we don't have to just always go to the same people we should mm -hmm. be Bring, amplifying yeah. other voices other languages all other kinds of things and so i just found his take so refreshing i was like dude the best conversation sometimes i'm like i just wish i had been recording right <laughs> now because this would have been a great podcast yeah. interview but uh i just i had an excuse to bring him back so anyway uh without further ado gilbert and Louie. Cool. well hey so so let me let me just so that I have this right, so that I say it right when we're talking about like what what actually is your title at Integrity? Like what do you what do you do? Yeah. Uh, my title is uh, officially uh, Integrity Music Director of A and R. Mm -hmm. So A uh, and R stands for Artists and Repertoire, and you know historically it's the person and the department and the the creative force behind a record label. Um, uh, and in a way to find the next talent or song or a combination of that into a project that makes um, a career path for an artist or an organization, but it's also, you know, a, a gem finder, a, uh, yeah. a, a, uh, a detective, so to speak, in the, in the world of music. So uh, I specifically work for a company that is nonprofit, um, and also have a ministry, a Christian ministry, um, heart and rhetoric behind it. So there are a lot of mechanisms that is record label, but there's also Christian ministry 
influences that um, that it kind of meets in the middle, actually, C- kind of works like a parachurch organization that helps resource and and um, and edify the church. <clears throat> so yeah, A and R director for Integrity Music. Awesome. So like to me, it, the what's in my brain makes sense in terms of when you say like artist and repertoire, and you're thinking about uh, you know finding a a rock band or something, and they're making albums and they're touring, and it's like okay, they finally build to this or whatever or i guess now they were viral on tiktok or whatever like how does it work for you like working with worship music how is is that is it a different process or is it still kind of the same thing it's like get in the machine and go i think it depends on the talent it depends on the artist slash band um i think i'm more focused on the songs (laughs) you know songs that's helpful in um in um edifying for the church in actually it's uh you know sometimes uh it's it's a song first kind of mentality and then we put artistry around it. Sometimes the artistry is so unbelievable you want to find songs <laughs> with the artistry. So it really depends, you know. Um, um <clears throat> Christian music industry, um, contemporary Christian music, or CCM, like born in America and for American listeners are mostly um, you know, centered around bands and artistry. And uh, I think internationally, uh, uh, bands and artistry gets less uh, known and songs are uh, more known, you know, if you think of uh, well-known songs in the church um, um, in the last 20, 30 years, you'll probably can't really associate with <laughs> one or two bands but you can associate the time frame of when those songs were born. So I think for me, it's um, it, it really depends. But I, I think when I think about my role and um, how, how how to best uh, communicate what we do, it's it's songs first mentality. Mm-hmm. So how like how do you find them? Like what like wow? How do you how do you find yeah. like hunt for these gems? <laughs> yeah, the man, it's a pretty big place. There's a lot of music out there. Exactly. Like, content overload so how do you absolutely absolutely i think i think we i think as people it's a people business man i think people first uh, and um a lot of it is word of mouth and what you find on social media and youtube and things out of nowhere on a sunday service they're trying to stuff on a live stream maybe or it's a song that that birth out of a nation or, or uh, the origin story of it, you don't know. And suddenly other churches are um, uh, are covering those songs and so suddenly it becomes a phenomenon. And I was like, okay, maybe this would work for this artist. You know, mm-hmm. I think a, a well-known example of that is uh, when we uh, partnered with a Nigerian artist um, and worship leader uh, named Sinach. She's been leading worship for about 30 years and in 2014, 2015, um, <clears throat> God give her a vision for another song that she wrote on a, pl- and, uh, on a flight. And um, she's based in Lagos, Nigeria. And the song was called Waymaker. She made a music video out of it. She made a project out of it, or several different projects out of it. And out of that, <clears throat> that song, <laughs> became an anthem for people in Alexandria, um, you know, uh, in Louisiana, became an anthem in Norway, became an anthem in London. And then suddenly some other artists like Michael W. Smith, like Leland, started discovering and leading those songs as if it's their own, Mm -hmm. Uh, even in the gospel scene with Benita Jones or whoever it is, it, it, it means so much to to another artist that they've adopted it as their own and that's an example one of example of i think a beautiful cross-pollination of how things could uh to and uh, you know asp- aspire you know it's like a song born more than 10 years ago <laughs> close to 10 years ago and then um and then in a, sh- a few short years were not only covered but it was carried in a way uh, that is so global and so when uh, when a world event like a pandemic happened, it just so it just seems so appropriate that that mess the message of that song is is uh, is global in nature. So that's I think that's one of the examples of how we look at 
songs and how it travels. And those are, that's a rare case where, you know, in, in um, four years of CCLI history, there is, is a Nigerian woman wrote a number one CCLI song, you know, and CCLI being a barometer of how, how, how far and how uh, in the reach of a song could be. So yeah. that, that, I think that's a powerful testimony of, and your gift can take you so many different places and with the powerful tool that is the internet and just people's heart um, um, joining with one message and one song that, you know, that's a, that's a good example of it. Um, so, yeah. So, so that, that, I hope that answers your questions. <laughs> yeah. No, I, well, the thing I thought was so interesting about Waymaker was not only that it was such a powerful song, but it, yeah it's a very different song. It doesn't really follow the kind of standard. This is what, this is what a song is supposed to do. It's, it actually has like the, the, the chorus isn't this like big belting thing. It's like this rhythmic, like almost yeah. chugging that kind of like takes over. Um, yeah. When you, when you're listening for songs, are you listening? Like, are you mainly looking at the reaction to them or are you trying to hear and go like, well, this is what this can be or this is how this can be changed to, to fit something better. Like, are you thinking about the final, like, this is what we're going to do with this and kind of working backwards, or are you finding things and like, Oh, this one's weird. Well, what are we going to do with this? And then. Yeah. I think all of the above, Jason, I think you just mentioned, you know, it doesn't sound like a song that you used, used to hearing, but I think from a, uh, when you're saying that it comes from a perspective, of Western American ear, right. Right. And, uh, but what about the rest of the world that doesn't hear like you or I, or, you know, so it just, it's a, all of the above of it. It has it from, from, from a stands or from a perspective of, okay, it has the right message, but the melody isn't there for this type of audience, but, or the melody is so good, but the lyrics, the lyrics isn't, you know, uh, um, isn't as um, digestible as we're used to in pop terms mm -hmm. um so it just you know it takes a quite quite a few um journeys a song a song <laughs> from its inception to a person a consumer's ear it takes a lot of different hands and different ears and different hearts to to make it what it needs you know and and there is that one looming thing that is the mystery of music <laughs> it's just you know it could be four chords that is so familiar to us that we've heard it in 200 different songs that could be you know um um so familiar sounding and then yet so catchy and so you know ear there's the ear candy things that that happens when when the producer does the right things the the right uh, section and there's unbelievable talent that supports it so it's just it's just a matter of um finding those combinations and i think yeah. my job and 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 even a worship leader's job on a sunday morning or or whenever they lead worship is kind of like that it's kind of like figuring out the right combination you know <laughs> whether it's a set list or it's if it's a song yeah so, so, so tell me about, so you, you've mentioned a number of times internationally, which is, yeah. I think something a lot of times in, in America, we don't even think through that, right? Like we always kind of have this idea of like our stuff goes other places, but other mm -hmm. stuff doesn't come to us necessarily, right. um, which is not necessarily right. But it's just something that I think is kind of like in the consciousness a little, like, are you actively working to bring out those other voices like outside, of, you know, outside of the U S and to, to bring those things from around the world? Yeah, I think my perspective is, um, I, I wouldn't say unique, but I think I, I, I um, you know, through my parents, um, I, I'm so grateful because I wasn't born in America. I, uh, you know, now, nowadays, I'm much more grateful because I was born in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, you know, uh, and through the ministry that uh, kind of propelled um, generationally through my parents, um, I, I'm here because of mission work. You know, Americans came to my country uh, of Indonesia um, hundreds of years ago and, 
evangelize and preach the gospel with that. They brought in their culture, their um, um, uh, traditions, their hymns, their books. <laughs> and I get that. And it, and it uh, bears so much fruit, you know, not just Americans. It was colonized by the Dutch. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, through wars, through, through different things, Christianity was introduced to Indonesia. And I, um, it, um, I, I grew up in America since I was about six years old. But, um, but, but I, <laughs> I happened to be so exposed to other countries and other nations and other cultures that I know, okay, Western Christianity has given a gift. But with a gift, there's also cultural things that um that when whenever America does something, 20 other nations follows, and there's good, bad, ugly, and generational stuff that that um that might not be helpful for a uh, a country or region. So the internet feels like it makes the world smaller that we can study other cultures, other nations before we even get there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but the superiority of American westernized church and the industry surrounding it, I think, um, is becoming aware that there are other places that ex- is expansionally uh, experiencing the move of God in a different way <laughs> than how Americans evangelize and, you know, basically preach the gospel. And I think it's beautiful. And I think it's it needs to be embraced. And I think my job is finding <laughs> those um, um, those hidden gems around the world and then seeing if it translate, you know, uh, in what we call the two high, the two sides highways of songs, is is the best way I could contribute to society. In my opinion, is by finding those hidden gems and collaborating with them. Um, the, the the latest thing I've done in my career was um, collaborate with uh, Portuguese speaking and worship leading. Um, Brazilians. Um, and um, last year we brought about 19 um, Brazilian content creators, worship leaders, worship artists, worship writers, and collaborate with them to unlock that uh, that that song of theirs, you know, um, that the, um, in co-writing is not, uh, you know, is not widely uh, known and, and, and for some cultures. And you know, we have to be respectful of that. Um, so, so next month I'm going to Sweden to, to, uh, to, to celebrate the, the pop music gift that they've given us through, <laughs> through years and decades of great, great sounding uh, melodies. And what about the reverential worship message that, um, that my, that what that my group can bring in, you know. So what I call that's what I call cross pollinating, um, you know, and and it just brings beauty into in, into into the church. Um, and the best thing, the best compliments, or the best thing that we can ever hear is a church or a you know a group of people that's inspired by this kind of music, but they didn't know <laughs> where it came from, mm-hmm. but. But at the same time, I want them to know where it came from. I want them to know where Waymaker came from. It didn't come from America or Australia or the UK. It came from Lagos, Nigeria. Mm-hmm. So hopefully when they, um, you know, hear how Holy Hallelujah or Risen Savior or some of these songs that you might not heard of, but I'm mentioning uh, it came from Brazil. It came from Sweden. It came from Mexico. It came from other places where there are <clears throat> Jesus loving people trying to figure out life and they happen to write something that works for uh, Jason in Bellingham, Washington. <laughs> so, so do you feel like there is, there is, um, you, you mentioned, you mentioned the words, so I'd like to dig into it a little bit more, like the idea of translating, not just through language, but even just musically, you know, it's like when I teach songwriting or when I'm, yeah. you know, like going through those things, it's always like, songwriting is communication and it's like we're trying to communicate something and I think a lot of the challenge sometimes is 
you know, it's like, oh, I've got the song, but you know, like, how do I produce it in a way that somebody can hear it? And like, there's, there's all these like pieces of it. Like, how do you do the, how do you translate the music over into, into different cultures and like uh, allow them to cross pollinate so that it's not something that pops over and people are just like, I don't like that because it's, they just don't, it's, it's unfamiliar. Like, do you have to kind of familiarize some of it? Right. I think it's trial and error. I think it's the right producer for the right project for the right season for the right time. <laughs> you know, uh, and some melodies, some instruments are not familiar to the ear, but it, you know, music moves by one degree shifts, just like, um, <clears throat> just like uh, any, any movement. So um, I'm giving you an example, maybe 10 years ago, the reggaeton sound where mm -hmm. it's the, is the, um, uh, bass, uh, the kick and the snare when it goes, things like that. It wasn't, it wasn't popular in pop music, but now it's the standard, right? Mm -hmm. so, so those Afrobeats influence or Latin or even African kind of rhythmic things are introduced by someone and then someone else makes it better. Someone else makes it better. That's just how music works, you know? Um, but the best music is something that someone could pick up a guitar or go on piano or harp or saxophone and they someone could instantly know what that is mm. um so it's the same thing for <laughs> it's the same thing as a as a uh, you know a timeless lyric well well we won't ever stop uh you know um um singing amazing grace or mm -hmm. or or in christ alone or whatever the evergreen um uh, songs are for for worship music music today but those those are things that are beyond our control and that we can surf to the church surf to the consumer of christian music or worship listeners and and just just try you know i think i think though um many in many ways we we are stuck in a formula <laughs> formulaic uh approach um uh, sometimes because oh we know this will work that's the first song and the second and then right before the preacher gets on you know th this would work too and then if it's a baptism sunday this would work after bap so it's it's in the formula in our heads that it's like an event right but we're trying to uh you know uh, uh push <laughs> um, our ideals into that box but there's so many subject matters in christianity in living uh, as an adult in 2023 or even as a kid that we don't sing about you know uh, <laughs> so i'm interested in those things too and i hope through um through through work like this we can kind of push a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and then okay five years from now we can talk about these things. We, we, yeah. we, we can, you can, we, we have songs about these things and we have other, other, <clears throat> you know, uh, means of communicating those worldly sounds into, a, into a more broad palette. <laughs> um, yeah. Because I think it's, it's a beautiful thing to celebrate other nations, other cultures, other, you know, uh, uh, other differences. So how do you, so how do you pull, so that's, that's so interesting to me because I, it is funny. Like I often think of worship music as a tool, mm -hmm. right? There's the, the side of it. It's like, okay, I'm trying to serve my congregation. And so it's, it's hammer and nails, you know, like it's, it's very like tactile and just like, I'm, yeah. I'm using this for this purpose. Um, but then there's also things that like, I don't know, lately, I, I think, especially it's like, I'm looking for a deeper connection for myself with music. And so and then I'm wanting to bring that and invite my community into it. Right. Yeah. Cause it's like, I think you can, it's easy to get to like, Oh, I know this is a good song. People like this song. And it's like, but is it, is it compelling? Is it, is it, is it sure. grabbing in my heart? Is it, is it moving me from the place I'm standing rather than just like feeding me the thing that I think I want. Right. Um, I would think in your world, it's gotta be so hard though, because you like, you have to measure success by like, well, did this take off? Oh, this one didn't take off. Like, how do you, like, how do you, Gilbert, yeah, uh, measure success in your, like, like for you? And when you, when you, in the, in the work that you do, like, when are you like fist pumping? Like, yes. Man, that's a loaded question. It's so hard to answer. <laughs> I, I don't think, 
because because when you when you deal with music in general you know there's metrics that says okay this popped off this this works this does it it, but when you add the component of spirituality and church and in and God, it's like, oh, okay, it might not work for a few years, <laughs> and then you might you might have moved on to a completely different thing, and then one song from a, one project that you know you you try to get away from comes back and says, hey, no, God is using that song somewhere, <laughs> you know. So I think measure the measure of success for me is like. Um, is that gut wrenching feeling? Is it pleasing to the object of why I created this for? Yeah. <laughs> you know, is 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 it is it about who is it about? Mm-hmm. And is, is 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 you know, and who is it for? If it's encouraging the people, great. We always need songs of encouragement. It's a it's it's a big bad world that we live in. But if it's, you know, if it's about um, our creator, our master, our savior, then the the measure of success is based on whether, it's, you know, like you say, it's usable for other people to gravitate towards that song. And if it lives, you know, um, and you may never know, I'm, I may not be doing my job anymore. And suddenly there's a thing that popped off that I did that I helped cultivate mm-hmm. a few years ago that, uh, that is, has become an anthem for someone. Yeah. So man, I can, I can measure success by a comment on Instagram or Facebook or something or 10,000 YouTube comments <laughs> saying how it helped people, or I could just focus on glorifying God with the songs that we were entrusted with, you know? So Sorry, I can't really answer that question, but uh <laughs> I know I I love it. I love that you're I well, I think it's really cool that you use that word like entrusted with, right? Like yeah, you know, it's is um I went to uh Leslie Jordan's thing that she was putting on with um, yeah. Tom Tom Douglas, right? The it was like the day after Anchor Hymns ended. Mm. And um it was interesting because one of the things he talked about, and I think he, I think he even just did it talking about it in a question and answer thing was he was like, he's like the idea is he goes as an artist, it's like your, your desire is to create something and then let, and then let the publishers and like the, the industry that exists, like take that and go do something with it rather yeah. than turning in, like making that something else, you know, like, like, let right. me go, let me, let me like, it's almost like the, the purposes of the machines are different, right? Like, and right. I think it's, and I think it's really, really cool to look at it from your perspective and say like, well, I'm, I've been entrusted with this. Yeah. How do I like, cause I, I run the same thing, like, uh, from a, from a songwriting perspective, I just, I really, I just want to, I want to serve my people and I want it to mean something to me because I'm not trying to make a career out of that. Sure. Um, would it be awesome if more people connected with it? Great. But like, it's just not where my time and everything can go into. Yeah. Uh, with worship artistry though. I feel total like the weight of stewarding sure. these song lessons and going, okay, I w- like, yeah, it is getting them into the hands of more people. I know for a fact that this can help musicians because I've just seen it so much. And I've yeah. also seen a lot of people struggle in worship life, you know, in worship musicians and ship and all the things that kind of go into that. So, so I totally, I just love that picture of like, well, we've been entrusted with this. Like, how do I, how do I serve? How do I continue to go, go, go with it? I think I can relate so much more to your job as a worship artistry in, in, uh, as a worship, as the, as the, you know, the, yeah. the someone who's trusted, interested, even though you found the thing and you've out, you know, you've grown it so much, you have this subscriber base and you, you, you know, you have people counting on you for these lessons, for these tutorials. I think my job's a little bit like that as yeah. well. You know, it's not yours. <laughs> Right, and, right. Uh, and 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 then it, it's like, okay, um, I'm gonna treat this with the level of respect and dignity it needs to, to, to you know, it need it needed to be. And then when I can't do it, I'm gonna say it, you know. So so my job is um harsh at some point because it's like um I have to deliver bad news all the time and say, hey, this is good, but I've heard this before. 
hey, right. this is good, but where were you and what were you doing when you wrote this? And do you think it's helpful for the church? It's just poking around the, um, the <laughs> for the best thing, for the best offering to the king, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, and as for you as a songwriter, um, you know, I can relate as well because a lot of the things that, um, a lot of the instincts that makes my job as uh, a a and R whatever as you as uh, as uh, the the you know the the founder of worship artistry is because I am a songwriter I am a musician <laughs> so it, that's where you develop taste that's where you develop you know your your sense of um, your sense of intuition so the 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 factor that we we haven't talked about here is the instant feedback that we get as soon as we release something mm-hmm. that is something in the last 10 15 years that's been new to our world that's been really um you know changing how we do things and that's you know uh, from one perspective it cuts the middleman from another perspective, it brings another host of opportunities to make content. And um, from a you know worship leader's perspective, sometimes it could get very distracting when you when you get instant feedback, and then okay, what's next? <laughs> it's a, you know, it never stops. You know, in that in that instant feedback, of course, is you know from from comments from uh, you know uh, from fr- from churches using the songs or or even 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 um, uh, people gravitating towards those songs as soon as it's released or teased or anything through social media. So um, so uh, when uh, thinking about you know our roles and in, in different ways, um, just I, I I always tend to uh, remember. Okay, there are so many unknown factors <laughs> that we have to account for in that as soon as possible we don't you know sometimes we bring the best and it just from a to z you check off all the box and it just you know falls flat sometimes is is totally unmixed totally this totally that and then it just breathes life to itself <laughs> that that is that is the mystery of of it all you know <laughs> it's like the the algorithm decided that it was going right. <laughs> to be algorithm <laughs> The algorithm, the algorithm likes it when it's not mixed. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but then the next time it'll, you'll do not mixed, it'll be like, "This sounds like this sounds terrible." What do you? Why right. would you put this out? You know, it's just right. an ongoing. And, and then if, if 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 it becomes successful, unmix. There's a host of people that's going to do the record, uh, that kind of record, and say, "Oh, they didn't mix it." Or whatever, or maybe yeah. that's the style. So we're gonna follow it. So it becomes a genre of unmixed music by itself. <laughs> I'm just using that as example, but yeah. it happens. So do you do you feel like so? How much are you reacting to what you see happening mm-hmm. versus kind of plotting a course and and going and going towards it? Yeah, I think I think um, I think I don't live in the present. I live either in the past or <laughs> or in the future. But um, I'm, I'm I think uh, my the nature of my job dictates to towards the future and plotting and something anticipating something that hasn't happened yet or you know the grumblings of it and making sure um, that you know um, it's. Whenever we have music or content, it not it's not only good, but it's like it hits the zeitgeist of society in a way that's compelling, that's uh, that's you know unique. Um, but um, but it's it's really hard to not get you know distracted by by what other people are doing currently, so or, or what has worked in the past. The thing is, there are no projects that are alike. Even if you if you if you redo a project that is you know successful or the same format, the variables change all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, so 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 for me, it's like okay, um, good. That's that's what they're doing. Let's keep going with this. You know, yeah. uh, until we can't. <laughs> so do you find? Um, so this is probably. 
do you find this is kind of my theory that's mm. good, that's that's kind of like behind the hidden verse podcast right mm. is is this idea that um because the songs that are successful are successful for the most part and i'm talking like mega successful right it's like you've got your chris tomlins and your hill songs and your which are usually are interesting because they're usually coming from a movement right they're usually coming mm-hmm. from like a this church is putting out this this and then people get behind what the church is doing or vice versa um but i just noticed like in terms of things that i often hear it's like it's like okay here's this really unique and different thing and you get it and you're like well this is really is just I've heard, like you said I, i've heard it before i've heard it exactly like this actually or i've heard it you know or it's a or it's a new twist on something but generally there is kind of a a a like a worship sound sure. to me. like you know and, it, and that kind of goes back to i think production and all those kinds of things too um and kind of like what we're looking for but how do you um how how do you in 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 what you do and in the way that you approach things, how do you raise up those raise up those different voices? Like, what would you say to songwriters who are writing? Are you are you looking at it like, yeah, dude, try and write that song that you think is going to be the mega hit, or do you do you push like, or do you push them towards like, no, just like have more of your own unique voice, and maybe it'll catch, and maybe it won't, and you should just be okay with that. Or like, how do you? Like, yeah. yeah, how did, like, cause you've talked, cause you, cause you and I were talking about that when we were in Nashville yeah. about just, you were saying how like, no, there's these certain voices that we hear all the time and we're trying to hear different voices. Mm-hmm. You know, how did, so how do you encourage songwriters who are, who are in that space? Like if you, if you came across, if you and I are sitting down yeah, and I'm like, and I'm like, Hey man, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to record a record. What are you going to, like, what are you going to tell me? Well, I'm going to say, Jason, why are you recording a record? And you're probably going to say, well, I've written 200 songs in my lifetime or 500 and I just got to get them out. And I said, "Okay," well, and I would just kind of ask you really hard questions that that would either propel you to keep going with this record or you're going to keep writing (laughs) until you get the you, you know, you have a message out there that's that is not only resonates with you. But it moves people um, beyond your wife and your kids and your church community. And I said, okay, Jason, I think it's time. And um, but Jason, um, I um, I would love for uh, the ability for for me to critique it if it sounds like this other thing or this other thing. Because it, sometimes when we're leading worship so much and we uh, it's other people's song and it, it gravitates to the church those influences can get to us and say, okay. And then it it's kind of uh, injected in, uh, in, in our songwriting. So I'll probably ask those kind of questions, but the, I think the reason that we have the worship music that we have for the last three decades is because of the, these ministries and these movements that they all work together, you know, the, you know, and then 2017, the, uh, I, you know, um, there, there's a research done that was uh, um, comparing in the last decade um, more than a hundred top CCLI songs are, con- uh, um, you know, there's only 18 writers <laughs> that contribute to those hundred um, uh, top songs that we sing in church today uh, in 2017. I think today it's even shorter the list is about 12 or 13 people and these people um are great good people that uh grew up and have raised up in the church in more of the charismatic pentecostal spaces of our denominations and they either live in sydney australia london uk uh nashville tennessee atlanta georgia Redding, California, or Los Angeles, <clears throat> or, or Orange County area, um, six cities <laughs> that, uh, you know, represents more maybe affluent, um, uh, westernized, Caucasian, mostly uh, church base that have multiple conferences and uh, merchandising and, and things that are 
uh, that propels them to create songs after songs after songs for various projects. And they all cross pollinate <laughs> and get together and create more songs for more projects and for more conferences, for more things. And these ministries uh, have benefited from, um, from them as um, just as they, these songwriters benefited from the ministry. Um, but I think that's like, that doesn't represent the majority of the church. What about the Catholics? What about the Presbyterians and Anglicans and, you know, uh, Baptists, or maybe some of those are Baptocostal, <laughs> you know? Oh, I forgot seven city. Seven city is, uh, is Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there's a few peppered in, in there, but, but my, uh, I think, um, I, I think because of those brands and big personality uh, pastors who are very charismatic, who are, you know, engaging on social media and all these different ingredients, um, the music that we have today is a result of those one degree shifts and ingredients that makes up uh, a uh, network of subculture of Christianity uh, uh, in, in worship music genre. It's become a complex of an industry, you know, so it feeds itself. It's, it's like a growing, uh, organism, you know? So I think my, I think my desire and people like me is to expand that, you know, make, making sure it's not just the 20% of the church that, and, 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 um, um, that gets a say in what the whole, you know, 80% of the church uh, sinks, but it's um, there. There's there's more uh, diverse thoughts and diverse uh, lyricism, especially around the subject matter of the gospel, which is unending, unrelentless. There's so many subject matters that we can speak and sing and write about. Um, so that, that's kind of my desire, and that's, that's kind of the data for you, you know, in the last six years of of, uh, of how just economics and uh, movements work, you know, and you and I and your listeners know the downfall in the, uh, you know, every uh, of ministries and uh, not just the downfall, but how how fast a ministry through social media and personalities could grow. But I think, uh, I, I think, um, yeah, I think Isaiah said it on at, at chapter four, some chapter forty. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. And the rough ground shall become level, and rugged places a plain. You know, but at the end of the at the end of that verse, it says the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and um, that's our hope through all these lows and highs, and uh, you know, in. Just think of centuries of Christian uh, messaging, the glory of the Lord gets revealed. So I'm not too worried about the current state as it is, but I am, I do have a burden and I do have like a, like a, a weight of, of responsibility and not just me. I think a lot of people does too, but to, uh, to make sure there are more um, thoughts and interesting ideas about about God that we can we can we we can we we can say in our in our songs, you know. <clears throat> yeah, well, and uh, so this this leads perfectly into um, what you're doing with Revere. Mm -hmm. right? I think I think that your your heart so speaks to, you know, like, like you say, it's like the glory of God. It's the mm -hmm. glory of God, you know, and. And, and and to just kind of follow up what you know what you're saying there too, like I am I am very much not coming from a space of of uh, this is wrong, no, right? like I'm not I'm like no, this is just it's not complete. It's not there's there's so many more voices that could be heard, right? And like you're so with Revere, you're not only approach like it's it's naturally different by the things that you're doing. So tell me a little tell me about your heart with Revere. What's going on with that? Yeah. Well, I think the history of Revere, I mean, it comes from a point of view slash extensive research of the data, some of the data I was telling you, and a lot of prayer and kind of um, grounding to the fact that worship and worship industry has become a business, <laughs> has become, you know, a church growth catalyzer 
but you look you look in the Bible, there's nothing like the catalytic agency of the glory of God, you know. So his glory, his the, the Lord, when the God reveals himself, it he doesn't need a set list. He doesn't need an event planner or a you know a certain time. So so what we're we're doing in Revere is like our long-term goal is for worship to worship, for worship to become worship again. <laughs> so that we're not worshiping worship itself, but we worship God, you know? So it, it opens up ideas and knocks the, the door of the church. And, um, and, and we can pivot from the preoccupation of like contemporary worship music and functional achievement of church growth and, and just focus on, Jesus, why why can't we make Christian music, worship music about God? <laughs> what does it has why does it have to always be about our pain, our struggles, and our you know anxieties and our everything we go through? That's important, but I don't I don't think God exists to help us with that. <laughs> I think God exists for us to give him glory through our pain and our joy and our sorrow in the human experience. So Revere is so unique because it brings back to, it brings back to, uh, uh, you know, listeners and people who subscribe to the idea of reverential worship uh, on a time where worship was about intimacy with God. In the last 30 years, in the last 20, 30 years, it's become a, uh, show off performance of how intense we can get when we sing louder or we 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 ex, you know we build up the tension of intensity mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, as if we can worship better than my neighbors you know but it's worship is so personal worship is a lifestyle unto God worship is a devotional devotion thing that you know it's like what can we do but surrender right <laughs> so, so you know with revere what we what we've done this in the last three years is gather people who are hungry towards these ideals and these ideas and create content based on the reverential worship of god um and hopefully some of those songs can translate to a Sunday morning uh, experience, or even from a Sunday, from a you know Saturday, Monday to Saturday uh, um, <clears throat> tool as a as a lifestyle. So so we're really kind of picky <laughs> and very very selective on um, the kind of songs that we write and the kind of people that we interact with when um, um, when creating. Um, master recordings and also the you know every tribe every tongue every nation component to it i think we say it so much in our services in our a daily context but how do we actually do it so um i think i think that's what revere is and you know we just made a record with three languages i don't know if it'll work on the same album but we did it and as as much as god allows us to collaborate and uh and just uh celebrate different cultures different people different types of thinking we're going to continually to continue to add different languages and different kind of styles into the revere <laughs> um you know uh, vocabulary Dude, I love, I just love how much you light up the moment you start talking about it. It's, it's, it's such a beautiful thing. And, and the, so tell me, okay. So tell me a little bit more about like with Revere, are these like projects that are being like, are you kind of like, are you like, how do like, what is Revere in terms of like, from a structural standpoint, is it sure. a like an umbrella over like a bunch of different songs or different artists or different churches? Like, is it its own, is it a group of people who are all doing this? Like how, like, what is the structure yeah. of Revere? It, Cause it's not like other things that I've seen. Yeah. It, it's, it's more of an initiative in a form of collective group of different people. 
I think if we can achieve that faceless, nameless type of thing, um, branding wise, it'd be amazing where it's the people are not really known, but the songs and the ideas are. So right now it's thought leaders, it's speakers who are authors as well and worship leaders, producers, basically people who make content, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, even business thinkers that are part of um, this think tank of, okay, how do we glorify God through messaging, you know, through songs? So, you know, from a music standpoint, um, that's how we collaborated. And we basically kind of cross-pollinated not just songwriters and songwriters, but songwriters and authors, songwriters and and um, people from other nations, other, other uh, you know, uh, other perspectives. So um, I would say the most accurate thing is to revere an initiative and a collective. And I hope um, we can build a catalog, a library of thoughts um, around the reverential worship of Jesus. I love that. It's, mm-hmm. it's so interesting because, and you correct me if I'm wrong on this, because I haven't fully studied all the history, but like yeah. my impression has always been like record labels, you know, we're, we're very much the gatekeepers. Right. And mm-hmm. so it was like labels trying, you know, it's going back to things like Backstreet Boys, like, like trying to manufacture hits yeah. to get yeah. out on the radio. Right. So kind of the, they're the gatekeeper. They're kind of holding things in place. Um, and then you have, then you had like churches, church movements rising up, right? So you kind of had the vineyard and you had, um, you know, the like passion and, and those things, right? Well, those, is, it almost seems like the reverse has happened. Like it was like when the churches were rising up in, in, in music, mm-hmm. it was like, oh, this is kind of getting more open. Yeah. Whereas now, because the churches have such, these few churches have such large voices, mm-hmm. it's almost like the smaller like now the label, now, you, now you're the record label guy who's trying to like, how do we get these no name? Like it's such a backwards way of thinking the way I think about it. Do you see a shift, you know, happening? Is that, is that, is that just happening with you? Is that happening elsewhere? I think it's been happening. It's going to continue to happen. And like I said earlier, I think the instant feedback, depending on how the the size of your audience <laughs> is uh it will 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 let you know how you know how things play out but i think those ministries who are very influential have, have very charismatic voices at the helm and and they they continue to you know uh, uh produce content and because they are massive in size of staff and creativity when it comes to songwriting things like that they will continue to churn out um resources for the not just for the local church, but for the global church. Um, I think um, record um, labels and industry middlemen or, or, you know, gatekeepers, things like that, the roles have changed. We could either amplify what's already happening uh, through social media, what, what's been, you know, what's kind of like uh, been um, uh, okayed by the masses or we can, or we we can find cultivate something and 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 uh, and and develop it and 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 see if it works or not. But I think it, it's um, yeah, the metrics have changed so much that you have to listen to what gravitates and what the uh, as as it pains me what the uh, algorithm and the AI is talking about <laughs> to you know all these all these mechanisms that make. Um, a song or a product or content go to another, <laughs> to, to a, to a consumer, you know? So the, there's challenges, but I think, um, yes, th- those are marketing and sort of uh, uh, influence needs, things like that. But I, I think uh, what we're doing with Revere is messaging uh, related. It's, it's, it's more like, um, you know, as endearing and as controversial, it's a protest. Mm-hmm. It is basically saying, hey, church, can we focus on why we're here in the first place, Jesus? <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. Yeah. So the focus is different. I think, Jason, the focus is different. And I, and I think, yes, those things matter. Every Every single stream, every single view count every single subscriber that it matters so much but 
um, I think what we're doing is um, is messaging <laughs> um, centered, you know? I love it, man. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's powerful. And it's, and it's interesting because, you know, my, one thing my pastor always says is he's like, the method is the message. Mm. You know, like if you have to sit there and explain what your thing is not all the time, like it probably huh. means it is that, you know, <laughs> like, like, and it's like, that's what we learn. If we all learn that, you know, uh, you know, that the, the, that the speaker always has a spotlight on them and a, yeah. all the stuff, you know, and is raised up above everyone. It's like, well, you can say like, Hey, I'm, you know, there's nothing different about me. And it's like, well, I kind of <laughs> like, yeah. you know, and so you guys in like changing your your method a little bit and then try and raise up these voices and lift these things. It's, it's, it, it, it's interesting because it, it feels different and it's different in a way that it's funny. Cause you can watch the videos and it's like, they're beautiful and the music is beautiful, you know? And it's like, it might take a few times to, to, to get what's happening, but you feel it happening, you know, even like mm-hmm. musically, you know, I think I was telling you, I was like, oh yeah, like if I just heard this and somebody was like, hey, play this at church, like I'd have to sit with it for a while because it's it's not <laughs> something that I, it's not in the style that I normally listen yeah. to. No, I at get the it. Same, at the same time though, yeah, it's very captivating and it is, it, it is compelling, you know, and mm-hmm. it's, and it's, it, it does feel like something different and that's, yeah, you know, why I wanted to highlight what you're doing and, and it's, Thank you, man. your heart behind it is just so it's so beautiful. And I, I feel the same way, you know, it's, it's funny, like with worship artistry, yeah. I, you know, there's, they're getting this point now where like a song comes across that has a lot of requests. That's like, okay, we need to, you know, we need to do, we need to do this. And, and then I listen to it and I'm just like, all right, how do we, how do we frame this? Because this doesn't yeah. feel like a congregational song to me. This feels like a, radio song that's about my personal testimony sure, right? sure. which which is totally like okay that's fine but it's kind of just pointing to your stuff it's like it's like this doesn't feel corporate it doesn't feel like something that we're yeah. doing together it feels focused on me and who i am and what's going on in my world yeah. rather than what's going on in god's world and how do i how do i partner with that right and um so yeah so just it's great to come across things that you're like oh this just thank you thank you for what you're doing i think it's Absolutely, man. I think it's awesome. And your heart behind it is incredible. And like I said, you just see you light up and man, I would love, I'd love for the CCLI top 100 to have a thousand writers on it instead of six, you know, like, yeah, it, it, it'd be great. It'd be really great. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, um, I'm, I'm doing things for the future <laughs> of yeah. what, what's possible, not currently to compete or to say this is wrong, or this is this, this is that. There's, you know, when people and organization comes to a certain, um, you know, stature, they want to repeat it. They want to continue the momentum. I, I totally get it. But um, j- just like your point of view of, okay, I might not get this song the first time or whatever, but, um, and, and, and try it, but it's captivating still. I think that's the exact approach what, what we're doing with not actually not only the lyricism but the musical stylings of it. Mm-hmm. And I think from from my point of view, it's to knock on the doors to the church again. What are we doing with our future musicians and minstrels and people who are responsible uh, in the Levitical calling of uh, of the of the church? Because the tools that we have, the the very many tutorials that you've done help so much of what other people have crafted. But what about the genuine creativity of people who who either are, you know, are beginners or novices or or, or experts, you know? So it just kind of like, okay, can we hit a gamut of, of people in the spectrum, a wide spectrum of you know, world listeners and gravitate towards each other. I think worship music used to be that way in the 90s and early 2000s. There are hard parts in music that we that we labor over, that we learn, that we just, you know, that as as much as we we learn Coldplay and U2 songs, we learn them. <laughs> You know, we, we, we learn, you know, uh, these licks and the, these these horn parts or violin or things like that. And it constraint to sometimes 
we could just hit space bar and the band is there. And mm-hmm. so how can, you know, saying all that, I'm not attacking anyone or anything. I'm just saying, how can we <laughs> say to musicians uh, in the future, hey, it, there, there are space for you. There, the, the, this is the, this is the, 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 the field uh, and the, the, the space for us to be creative with our worship towards God, you know, and not just copy everything, everyone, every, every way. <laughs> totally, man. And it's, it's funny because it's, you know, with worship artistry, like I named it worship artistry for a reason. Yeah. It was because it was like, the idea is like you, when you understand what's been done, mm-hmm. then you can do something else with it. Right. And it's, and it's sad to me, the amount of like, well, I just need to recreate this thing. It's like, no. but I don't, I don't want you to do that. I don't think. Yeah. I, I don't think you were created to do that. Now, no. does it mean that, does it make it possible that like, like I think about it for myself, like, you know, being a, being a worship pastor and ha- having something like with worship artistry, I can send somebody and go like, Hey, you're not there yet, but like here, use this tool for a while. And yeah. that can help you develop your ability and like all those kinds of things. But still the idea is to get it back in the hands of put music back in the hands of musicians. Yeah. You know, rather than like trying to create a like uniform thing that we all do. And it's like, good. I know that if I go to like McDonald's, you know, I know if I go into McDonald's, it's going to look like this everywhere I go. Right. And it's like, I don't want it to. I don't, I think it make. I think that's, I think it's, it misses the beauty of the diversity of the body, you know? Um, so, absolutely. So I love that you're, that you're contributing to that, man. Yeah. I actually see the Revere live streams on my YouTube almost every day. They're really good. They're really good. And I love, I I didn't even know that they were integrity before. I didn't pay attention. It's like somehow popped up on my Spotify, like the very first project that they did. And I think they had like Mark Barlow on it and uh, Doe Jones and a few others. And it was just like random combinations of people in my mind of like, this is weird. Like I'd never seen these people do anything together. And I listened to these projects and I was like, this is so good. Like these songs are so good. They, and they're, they all have this uniqueness to them, whether mm-hmm. it's like a weird chord change or whether yes. like there's something yeah, yeah, yeah. that like that idea of reverence, I feel like the music actually carries that feeling. Like you don't even need to hear it in the mm-hmm. language that, you know, because you know what it's about. Like, yep. I think there's something really powerful about that. And I love the fact that they're like raising up other voices, you know, and I, one of the conversations I have a lot with people is, you know, talking, you know, if you're somebody who's going like, oh man, I just feel like all the worship songs are the same or we only hear these five people or whatever, right? Part of that is an audience problem. Like part of that is a consumer mm-hmm. problem. It's going, well, I'm not willing to go out and look for anything else. I'm just going to take what's... What's, what's on the radio. What, yeah, what's fed to me, right? And it's like, well, this is all kind of the same. And it's like, well, that doesn't mean... A, it's not all the same. I know, yeah. I've taught all the songs. And they're not all the same because if they were, they would take much less time. <laughs> but I know what you're saying. Yeah. And I will say that, like, if we want to be, if we want to hear other music, if we want to hear other voices, we need to find those voices and we need to share those voices. Yes. We need to actually not just go, oh, that's cool. We need to go, hey, have you heard this? Mm-hmm. Because that's how other voices get heard. You know, if it's outside the radio, if it's outside, you know, kind of the mainstream arenas, it's like, we need to not just hear it, but we need to talk about it. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm excited to talk about Revere. Yeah, I actually love, that's, I feel like my specialty is only listening to artists that no one else knows about. <laughs> that is true. You often bring All up. All the worship yeah. artists that are like low key indie worship. Like that's where I live. Like. All of the, the big teams, like I love them. I'll listen to all their projects once they come out and I still lead like some of their songs. But in my own time, I, I'm digging in the archives of finding the new, the new guys. Okay, well, give me somebody that you, give me somebody you're liking right now. <laughs> right now, okay. Well, I, that's a bad example because right now I'm actually liking some like very <laughs> like, Have you heard ones. of Hillsong? Have you heard, heard of Hillsong Have you heard of recently? Elevation? They're really good. Uh <laughs> Well, I, I mean, Mark Barlow, I mentioned him at the, at the start, but he, uh, he's from a group called Isla Vista Worship. Mm-hmm. I told you about yep, them before. Yep. They're a small missions team in Isla Vista, California. Uh, but they released some of the vibiest, like, cool-sounding worship songs. Mm-hmm. Like, not, nothing that I've actually led um, on a Sunday morning, I don't think. 
No, nothing. But it's what I listen to and what I choose to listen to in my own time. Right. And it's, and it's worshipful. Like there's, it's, I, I think, yeah. I think we do ourselves a massive disservice when we only listen to worship for what Sunday is going to be. Yeah. Like I have all my best worship times when I'm by myself mm-hmm. and then I get to bring that out into mm-hmm. my community and, and then it's amazing. Right. Yep. But it's like the song that works on Sunday with a hundred people or 500 people or a thousand people. It's a very different song than the one yeah. that works with, uh, you with know, in the intimacy yeah. of my living room. Yes. You know? Yeah. For sure. I mean, even I, I would say that for how I lead um, on my own versus when I lead at church. Like mm-hmm. when I lead a living room worship night versus a church worship night, it's very different. But that's a whole other tangent and we're not going to get into that That's today. right. We got to go. We got to go. <laughs> and you need to go to worshipartistry.com. Nice. Jason, why do they need to go there? <laughs> oh, you're, I thought you were going to land the plane right no. from there. I was so excited. <laughs> well, you need to go there because we have over 600 song tutorials yes. for bass, drums, keyboard, acoustic guitar, electric guitar, and three-part harmony. And when you take those all together, your worship team can sound amazing. And then they can go make the song their own. Yes. And that is, don't stop there. Don't stop at just learning the way it is. Make it something that reflects your community. That's what we're most excited about. Yes. And so we will see you next time.